Hey guys, great to be with you here this morning. I don't know if you caught this news story during the week about two young Aussie blokes who were um, who somehow fooled North Korea into allowing them into the country in order to play golf in an international tournament over there. I don't know, did anyone catch this news story during the week? I thought, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, they somehow convinced authorities that they were the Australian golf team. <laughs> and they got invited into this international tournament. They then got to go and visit different dignitaries and got to go to different ceremonies and stuff like that as they were chaperoned around North Korea for five days. But the funny thing was, right, is that when they came to play in the tournament, these two blokes actually don't even play social golf. Like, golf's not even a hobby for them, right? So when they came to play in this international tournament, they played so badly, they played so badly, that their caddy said to them, you have brought great shame on your country and your family. (laughs) And I heard, actually, when they went to tee off, the first guy who teed off hit the first ball straight into the water. So the writing was kind of on the wall from the get-go. I love that story. I just think it's hilarious. I love stories because stories, they grip our hearts and they, and they grab our attention and they communicate truth sometimes in a way that pure dialogue doesn't. And, and the salvation story of Christianity is probably the greatest story in history, right? The fact that God became a man and died on a cross to pay the penalty that the sins of his creation deserve so that they might be back in relationship with him. You'll never get a better story than that. And that's why Hollywood have been ripping off that story and its themes for years and years and years. And I actually also heard during the week, um, Mel Gibson was being interviewed by a guy in the late night show called Stephen Colbert. And they were talking about uh, the fact that Mel Gibson has actually got a sequel. He looks a bit like Santa Claus now, doesn't he? He's got a sequel coming up to the Passion of the Christ movie. And him and Stephen Colbert were talking about some of the themes that are in that movie. I don't know if you've seen that. And, uh, And then Stephen Colbert said this. He said, well, God becomes a man and rises from the dead well, that's never going to be a snoozer, is it? <laughs> that's, that's a pretty incredible story. And, and, you know, Jesus is the hero of that story, the greatest story in the history of mankind. And Jesus also, he was a master storyteller. And he told loads of stories when he was here and walked this earth 2,000 years ago. In fact, in Matthew, it says that when Jesus was speaking to a crowd, he didn't say anything to them without using a parable, without using a story. You know, storytelling is something of a, maybe it's not a lost art, but it's a, it's a dying art in our culture. In our Western, modern day, storytelling has become a bit of a dying art. But over the next few months, over the summer, we're going to be looking at a handful of the parables or the stories that Jesus told. And what we're going to notice is this, that although they're small stories, they carry big ideas. Although they're really small stories, they've got huge ideas that they're communicating. And now a number of these stories, if you've been in church a long time, a number of these stories are going to sound pretty familiar to you. Stories like the prodigal son or what we're looking at today, the parable of the sower. But I I want you to recognize this, that these stories were told in an Eastern context some 2,000 years ago. So sometimes when we hear these stories, sometimes when we read these stories with our Western mindset and through our Western and modern culture, we misunderstand actually what was being communicated. So I just want to say that by way of introduction so that over the next few weeks you don't switch off and think I've heard this story before and I know what it means because there's going to be truth that's going to be revealed to you over these next few months that maybe you hadn't yet seen. So I mentioned that we're kicking off the series with this parable, the parable of the sower. And interestingly about this parable, Jesus actually tells this parable in order to explain why he tells parables. It's kind of a parable within a parable. It's a little bit like Inception, a dream within a dream. And it's found in Matthew 13, which is where I'm going to be reading from, also Mark 4, also Luke 8. So you can either open your Bibles, turn on your Bibles, or just follow along on the screen behind me. Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, The plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. 
Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jesus then goes on to explain to his disciples why he teaches in parables, and then goes on to explain what this parable actually means, which is what we're going to be looking at today. What was Jesus communicating when he told this parable? Again, it's a little story, but it contains some really big ideas. And this parable, it's all really about how we receive the word, how we receive and respond to truth. So as we look at this parable and other parables over the next few months, we should be asking ourselves questions, asking ourselves questions like, where am I in this story? And how am I responding to the truth that has been communicated? Am I letting that truth take root in my heart? Where am I in the story? And how am I responding? Because wherever you are on your journey of faith, and whatever worldview you might have, you feature in today's story. You feature somewhere in here. So your first question might be, well, I don't know how I'm going to receive this message. What is this message? What is the seed that you're talking about? You might also be wondering, well, who is the sower? And what do the soils represent? And we're going to get to those bits. But first of all, we're going to look at what is the seed? What is the message? Now, Jesus is teaching a crowd of people about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And as a bit of an introduction to this extended teaching uh, series, really, that he's going to do, teaching about these parables, about what the kingdom of God is like, he wants to prepare them for the fact that different people are going to hear this story and respond in different ways. That's why he tells this parable first. And the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, as it's termed here in Matthew, is very simply God's rule and God's reign here on this earth. See, God, he's always been large and in charge, and he always will be, and he always will reign. But in a sense, when Jesus came, it was a little bit like the inauguration of that kingdom. It was a little bit like the inauguration. This is what I mean. See, what Christians believe that the Bible tells us is that God created everything, that God's the creator, and he created us in love to have a relationship with with him. That was his intent. That was his purpose. But he didn't create us as robots. He created us with free will. But what we did as free willed humans is that we took that free will and we rubbed it in his face and we said, no, thanks, God. We'd rather not live under your rule and live under your reign. We'd love to be the king of our own kingdom. And what the Bible says is that that is called sin. And sin's a really big deal. Because whether you've actively or consciously or maybe just passively rebelled against God, the Bible calls that sin, and sin is a big deal to a holy God, a holy and a perfect God. Sin's not just doing bad things. And actually, you know, sin's, sin can actually be doing good things and hoping that it makes you holy. You know, sin is a big deal to God, and it's created this big chasm, this big gap between us and our Creator, us and our Father, that was never meant to be there. And the reason that Jesus is coming was like the inauguration of that kingdom, is because when Jesus came, His message was, you were created for more than this. You were created with significance and purpose and meaning and fulfillment in this life that you're yet to discover. You were created in love, by love. You were created by perfection and for perfection. You were created for harmony. You were created for wholeness. And when Jesus came and when he died on the cross and paid the penalty that our sins deserved, what he was saying was, I've come to take you back to that place. And that's why Jesus' coming is a little bit like the inauguration of the kingdom of God. But you might be sitting here today... (laughs) And you might be thinking, well, that all sounds fine, and maybe I've heard some of that before, but I'm not sure I believe it. Because if Jesus really did come to do all that you said he did, and if he really did come to reveal God to us, then why didn't he do it in today's age where we've got video cameras? Why did he do it 2,000 years ago? Why didn't he appear in the middle of George Street, in front of the news cameras, perform some miracles so that everybody would believe? Have you ever wondered that? I think what Jesus is saying is this, the kingdoms of men come through force, 
and they, and, they, and they come to make people submit to them. But the kingdom of God is different. It comes gently. It comes like a seed to us. At first, that seed, it might look vulnerable. It might look weak. It might look completely underwhelming to you. But the kingdom of God comes as a truth, as a seed to be planted that will change the landscape of the human heart, that will change the field completely. The kingdom of God is a crazy message. It's crazy because this is the message that God left his throne in heaven and came down to earth to be a man. All right, that's crazy. And that he triumphed by being tortured and killed. That's crazy. Now, his followers know that in order to find themselves, they must lose themselves. That's crazy. And the way up is actually down. Right? That's crazy. And the way to be rich or wealthy is actually to give away everything that you have. That's a crazy message. Right? And the way to be powerful is actually to become a humble servant to other people. And the way to grow in wisdom and love and Christ-likeness is actually to endure suffering and trial and learn dependence on Him. That's a crazy message. Is that the message that's meant to change the world? Yeah, that, that's the kingdom of God. That's the message that's going to change the landscape of the human heart. Because the kingdom of God comes by receiving a truth. It comes by receiving a truth. The littlest thing that doesn't seem to make much difference at first but eventually it changes the whole field. And if you haven't realized it yet, in this meeting, you would have heard that we've been singing all about Jesus because the kingdom of God is all about Jesus. It's all about his message and what he came to achieve. It's all about him. And so if the kingdom of God is Jesus and his message, then the soil represents our hearts and how we're gonna receive him and receive the message that he brings. So there are four types of soil mentioned in this passage. Let's look at each one of them briefly. Verse 4, As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Do you respond to God with a hard heart? Do you respond to God just kind of intellectually? Now, I don't know a lot about gardening. I live in a unit for a purpose so that I don't have to worry <laughs> about gardening. I don't know a lot about it, but I know this. I know that a seed, in order to germinate, needs to get underground. It needs to get below the surface. Now, perhaps this is your first time here at Grace City today. Maybe it's your first time ever in a church. And if it is, I just want to say thanks so much for coming. It is such a privilege and an honor to have you here today. But whether you've been here in church for a long time or a short time, and whether you read your Bible often or you don't read it very often, what this parable is saying to us is that it's possible to come to the Word regularly, but with a hard heart, and not really let it penetrate the surface, not really let it get below the surface. So what Jesus is asking here really is, have you let the kingdom of God, have you let the gospel come to you personally? Or have you only really really approached it from an intellectual point of view. I had the, um, the huge privilege of hearing a gentleman's story recently about how he came to faith. And uh, I hope that you all get to hear it one day because it's an incredible story. Uh, and this guy is a very intelli highly intelligent man, highly intelligent man. And before he came to faith, he actually had a bunch of um, intellectual hang-ups about why he couldn't believe in Christianity. But... <laughs> When he actually started digging down into some of these intellectual hang-ups he had, he realized he was actually on the wrong side of the debate. <laughs> and actually, he had been misled and betrayed by science all along. Right? But do you know when, when the gospel really came alive to him? It was when he realized that God was his father and that he was a child. And when, that was when the seed penetrated the surface for him. Because... When he was a very young boy, he found out that he's actually adopted, right? And that, that threw his worldview upside down. And he began asking himself questions like, where do I fit in? And where do I belong? And am I ever really meant to be here? And he, and he felt like maybe he would, maybe those questions would find, would, would be satisfied 
when he was able to meet his birth mother. So he started searching for his birth mother. But what he found was even when he met her, he still had those questions. He was still asking, where do I fit in? How do I belong? Am I meant to be here? And those questions weren't actually satisfied until he came to an understanding that he has an identity in Christ and that God is his father and that he is a child of God. That's when the seed penetrated the surface for him and where it took root. It was an incredible story. And so I want to ask you today, have you come to God just intellectually or have you responded to him in your heart? Yes, we're called to love the Lord our God with all our minds, but also our heart too. Has there ever been a time where the word of God, maybe that you've heard numerous times before, came to you personally, when your name was actually on it, when it came alive to you and it amazed you and it thrilled you? If you haven't had a time like that in your life, then maybe you've still been coming to the Word of God with a hard heart, and maybe it's yet to penetrate the surface. That's the first type of soil. The second type of soil, some of the seed fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Do you come to the Word of God maybe with a shallow heart, maybe just emotionally? Maybe there was a time in your life where you did respond to the Word of God with joy, as the verse goes on to say, and and some sense of life sprang up in you. Perhaps you got very excited about Christ and it got past the intellectual into your heart, but you've never taken the time for the roots to actually dig down deep into your heart. And so the roots aren't deep enough, and when the circumstances of life and the heat of life come on you, you end up being scorched. These people are people who've accepted Christ and they've experienced something of the joy of the Lord in their life. But as soon as sufferings and trials come, as soon as the heat of life comes on them, as soon as they lose important things in life, they turn their back on God because they say, well, what use is Christianity to me if I can't have these things, these, these things that were important to me? Because it's those things that they were actually worshipping, not really God. Because they thought, they thought that they were entering Christ's kingdom, but what they actually truly believed and what they truly hoped was that Christ would enter their kingdom. Because they were wanting Christ to fulfill their needs. Because they weren't actually after a saviour, they were after a blesser. They weren't really after a king, they were after a sugar daddy. Because they were after having their needs met more than they were having their sins, being saved from their sins. And they've never actually transferred trust from their, the important things in their life and themselves to their Savior. They've never got to that point. That's what's represented by the second type of soil. Are you there? Does that represent you today? And I want to take a moment, and this might feel a bit like a gear change here, but I want to take a moment to mention something that I think is really important in the Christian life and important in the life of Grace City Church, and they are connect groups. You know, connect groups are small groups of people who get together in homes all over the northern beaches at different times of the day and different days of the week to encourage each other in God and to do life and share life together with other people. And the reason that I'm saying that they're important and the reason I want to encourage you to attend one, if you don't already, be a part of one or maybe increase your activity in the group if you are officially part of one, is not because I want to make your life busier. <laughs> that's, that's not what I want. And it's not because I think that being a part of a connect group is actually going to save you or sanctify you in any way, or not because it's an obligation of membership here at church that you have to fulfill, but because connect groups and discipleship contexts like them are a means where we can cultivate our soil, because we go to people who love us and who want to encourage us and provoke us and ask us questions like, hey, how's your heart? How's your soil? Because there are a chance for us to go to somewhere where we can connect with God and with other people, experience His love personally for ourselves, and also where we can grow together and we can dig into truth together so that the roots can dig down deep into our heart. And connect groups they don't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. <laughs> that's, that's not what they do. But these sorts of things, they do help the roots go down deeper into your life. 
and they do help you withstand some of the heat from life circumstances that might come your way. So have you responded to God with a hard heart? Or have you responded to God maybe with a shallow heart? What about the third type of soil? Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Have you responded to God with a, let's call it a divided heart? Right, because the second type of soil, the soil we were just talking about, is full of plants who withered when the heat of sun circumstances, the heat of life circumstances came. Because what they were actually finding was that they were actually controlled by the things of this world. The third type of the soil is subtly different, right? Because the seed has taken root, but what they've discovered is that they're sharing control of their life with other things. It's Christ plus something else. They worship Jesus, yes, but there are other things in life that they pursue just as much or maybe more than Jesus. He's not number one in their life. As Mike was saying, everything else hasn't taken a back seat yet in their life. Because the message of the gospel is this, Jesus, period. Not Jesus plus something, not Jesus added to anything else, just Jesus. And, and the third type of soil represent people and hearts where you've added something to the simplicity of the gospel message. You've added something else to it. And that's something else. It's, they're not always bad things, actually. Sometimes they're good things. Maybe you've added, it's Jesus plus your career. Or maybe it's Jesus plus an important relationship. Or maybe it's Jesus plus wealth creation. It could even be something like Jesus plus the importance of good theology or Jesus plus some worldly philosophy. What is it? Is it Jesus plus something in your life? Because those things, they're not necessarily bad things. Some of them are good things. But those good things become bad things when we turn them into God things. Those good things become bad things when we allow them to be God things. Because that, it's the essence of what idolatry actually is. It's putting something in the place where only God should be. It's just Jesus, not Jesus plus anything else. And see, the part of the problem is for, for the people in this soil, the people of these kind of hearts, is that they, they don't experience the kind of contentment and wholeness that they're expecting to, right? Because they live anxious and they live doubting all the time because they're not experiencing the joy that they were hoping so they figure I must be doing something wrong <laughs> and so they doubt maybe I'm not doing the right things maybe I'm not doing enough of that stuff they live anxious they live doubting all the time because they've committed to Christ but they've also committed to other things and that's what it looks like I think in the Christian life to feel choked right because the first two types of soil they end up deciding I think that Christianity is a crock and they leave <laughs> right, the hard heart, the shallow heart, when the circumstances of life change, they end up deciding this isn't for me, I'm out, right, but the third type of soil, if you're represented by this, you can't leave because you know too much, right, because the seed has taken root in your life, and because it has sprung up, the problem is it's been choked by other things, so you can't go back, but you're also not going forward either, and, and, and so you're sad, Maybe you're miserable, actually, because you're not experiencing the kind of joy and completeness and fulfillment that you were hoping to, that the Bible says that you will by being committed to Christ, because you're not only committed to Him. There are these other things that are in the way as well, choking your Christian life. So how's your soil? How's your heart? How have you responded to the message of Jesus? Maybe with a hard heart, maybe with a shallow heart, maybe with a divided heart. You know, wherever you see yourself in this story today, that's not your life sentence, right? Because soil can change. Soil can change. That's not where you're going to be forever if you don't want to be there forever. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but I just want to give you a couple of bits of application to finish. Now, as I looked at this passage in particular this week, I had this question which was burning in the back of my mind. And my question was this. I understand why Jesus was telling the, uh, the crowd this story, because he's about to tell them about the kingdom of God, and he's preparing them for the fact that different people are going to respond to the message in different ways, because there's different types of soil represented in the crowd, right? So I get that bit. But then he goes off, and he, 
tells the disciples what it means, and he goes into more detail with them. And I'm wondering, why does he do that? That's my question. Because they're all the fourth type of soil, aren't they? They're all the good soil, because they've received the message of Jesus, because they're sold out for His kingdom and His purposes, because they're following hard after Christ. That's what makes them disciples, after all. They're followers of Jesus. So why does He explain it to them? Why does He go into detail with them? Because they're all the fourth type of soil. And I think it's probably because they had times where they wondered, why doesn't everybody respond to this message the way that I do? And if you're a Christian here today, you probably wonder the same thing sometimes. Why don't other people respond to this amazing message the way that I have? What's wrong with the message? If it truly is the greatest story ever told, if it truly is the greatest news that people will ever experience, that Jesus came to redeem us back into relationship with Him and restore our meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life, then why don't other people believe? What's wrong with the message? And I think Jesus explains this parable to the disciples because he's, he's saying, look, I'm, I'm liberal with the seed that I scatter, right? I, I'm, I'm throwing these seeds, I'm throwing my message everywhere, right? It is available to everybody just as it is available to you. As in Romans 1, Paul goes on to talk about how uh, he, God has made himself known to us through creation, through our hearts. He's made himself known to us. Jesus is saying, look, I'm liberal with the seed. The same message is available to everybody. The problem isn't the message. The difference is how people will respond to and receive this message. Verse 13, he says, though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. So I think Jesus is encouraging them, look, there's nothing wrong with the message. You don't have to fix that bit, right? Keep preaching the gospel. Keep sharing the love of Christ with people who haven't experienced yet. There's nothing wrong with the message because there's an encouragement, I think, in this too. And that is that when the message falls into good soil, it will produce a crop. It will produce a, a harvest. It will produce fruitfulness 160 or 30 fold. There is an encouragement here, which is that when the seed, the message of the gospel and the love of Christ that we share with people falls into good soil, it will produce fruitfulness. Finally, and perhaps you feel like you identify more, not with the good soil, but with one of the first three types of soil. And you, you feel like you want to change. You feel like you want your heart to be different than what it is now. Well, what what is the secret to that? And I'd say that we, we need to remember that we are soil and that God is the gardener. And we need to ask ourselves whether we're receiving the seed, but it's not actually our job to change the soil. Soil doesn't change itself. It's God, the gardener, who changes the soil. So have you allowed the seed to penetrate the surface And have you allowed it to take root in your life? Do you feel maybe strangled or choked because you've given your heart away to other things as well as Jesus in this life? I believe that Jesus' encouragement to you would be to bring that to me. Bring that to God. Bring that to the gardener and allow him to deal with the soil. Allow him to deal with your heart. Because I think if we go to God and we say, God, I have these blockages in my life. Please, would you deal with them? God, I have these thorns in my soil. Would you please rip them out? God, I have these stones and I have these rocks. Would you please get rid of them for me? I think what Jesus is going to say to that is, of course. Of course, because I've already taken your thorns and they crowned me with them. I've already taken your rocks and the stones and they buried me under them. Because actually, I've already dealt with all that. And I just want you to come to me and ask, and I will. What's the fourth type of soil? What does a heart look like that is responding to the gospel well? I think, do you know that old hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross? There's that, lo- there's that line in it that says, A love so amazing and so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my all. I think that's what the fourth type of soil looks like. And what is this love so amazing? It's that while we were still dead in our sins and transgressions, Christ died for us. 
and that he who had no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the love so amazing. That we are fully accepted and affirmed in Christ. That we have access to God and we have the affirmation of our heavenly Father. That's the love so amazing, the love so divine. And so that's the, that's the kind of love that we're responding to. And the response that it demands is, here's my soul, here's my life, here's my all. And I think if we haven't responded in that way yet to Jesus and to his message, it's because the seed hasn't hit the bottom yet. Because there's, there's something blocking it. And I think we need to take our hearts to Jesus, take it back to the cross and ask him to deal with it. Why don't you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us maybe just quickly before we sing.